Bertel Thorvaldsen. A few months ago we visited a plain old house in Copenhagen, the boyhood home of the great Danish sculptor. Here he worked with his father, a poor wood carver, who, thinking his boy would be a more skilful workman if he learned to draw, sent him to the Free Royal Academy of Fine Arts when he was twelve years old. At the end of four years he took a prize, and the fact was mentioned in the newspapers. The next day one of the teachers asked, Thorvaldsen, is it your brother who has carried off the prize? Bertel's cheeks colored with pride as he said, No, sir, it is I. The teacher changed his tone and replied, Mr. Thorvaldsen, you will go up immediately to the first rank. Years afterward, when he had became famous, he said no praise was ever so sweet as being called Mr., when he was poor and unknown. Two years later he won another prize, but he was now obliged to stay at home half the time to help support the large family. Obtaining a small gold medal from the academy, although so modest that, after the examination, he escaped from the midst of the candidates by a private staircase, he determined to try for the large gold medal. If he could obtain this, he would receive a hundred and twenty dollars a year for three years, and study art in Italy. He at once began to give drawing lessons, taught modeling to wealthy boys, and helped illustrate books, working from early morning till late at night. He was rarely seen to smile, so hard was the struggle for daily bread. But he tried for the medal, and won. But visions of fame must have come before him now, as he said good-bye to his poor parents, whom, alas, he was never to see again, and taking his little dog Hector, started for far away Italy. When he arrived, he was so ill and homesick, that several times he decided to give up art and go back. He copied diligently the works of the old masters, and tried in vain to earn a little money. He sent some small works of his own to Copenhagen, but nobody bought them. He made Jason with the Golden Fleece, and, when no one ordered it, the discouraged artist broke it in pieces. The next year he modelled another Jason, a lady furnishing the means, and while everybody praised it, and Canova said, this young Dane has produced a work in a new and grand style. It did not occur to any one to buy the statue in marble. An artist could not live on praise alone. Anxious days came and went, and he was destitute and wretched. He must leave Rome and go back to the wood carving in Copenhagen, for no one wanted beautiful things unless the maker was famous. He deferred going from week to week, till at last his humble furniture had been sold, and his trunks waited at the door. As he was leaving the house, his travelling companion said to him, "'We must wait till to-morrow from a mistake in our passports.' A few hours later Mr. Thomas Hope, an English banker, entered his studio, and struck with the grandeur of his model of Jason, asked the cost in marble. Six hundred sequins, or twelve hundred dollars, he answered, not daring to hope for such good fortune. That is not enough. You should ask eight, said the generous man, who at once ordered it. And this was the turning point in Bertel's life. How often a rich man might help a struggling artist, and save a genius to the world, as did this banker. Young Thorvaldsen now made the acquaintance of the Danish ambassador to Naples, who introduced him to the family of Baron Wilhelm von Humboldt, where the most famous people in Rome gathered. Soon a leading countess commissioned him to cut four marble statues, Bacchus, Ganymede, Apollo, and Venus. Two years later he was made professor in the Royal Academy of Florence. The Academy of Copenhagen now sent him five hundred dollars as an expression of their pride in him. How much more he needed it when he was near starving, 
all those nine years in Rome. The bashful student had become the genial companion and interesting talker. Louis of Bavaria, who made Munich one of the art centers of the world, was his admirer and friend. The Danish king urged him to return to Copenhagen. But as the Quirinal was to be decorated with great magnificence, Rome could not spare him. For this he made, in three months, his famous Entry of Alexander into Babylon, and soon after his exquisite bas-reliefs, Night and Morning, the former, a goddess carrying in her arms two children, Sleep and Death, the latter, a goddess flying through the air, scattering flowers with both hands. In 1816, when he was forty-six, he finished his Venus, after having made thirty models of the figure. He threw away the first attempt, and devoted three years to the completion of the second. Three statues were made, one of which is at Chatsworth, the elegant home of the Duke of Devonshire, and one was lost at sea. A year later he carved his exquisite Byron, now at Trinity College, Cambridge. He was now made a member of three other famous academies. Having been absent from Denmark twenty-three years, the king urged his return for a visit at least. The royal palace of Charlottenburg was prepared for his reception. The students of the academy escorted him with bands of music, cannon were fired, poems read, cantatas sung, and the king created him councillor of state. Was the woodcarver's son proud of all these honours? No. The first person he met at the palace was the old man who had served as a model for the boys when Thorwaldsen was at school. So overcome he was, as he recalled those days of toil and poverty, that he fell upon the old man's neck and embraced him heartily. After some of the grandest work of his life in the Frue Kirke, Christ and the Twelve Apostles and others, he returned to Rome, visiting on the way Alexander of Russia, who, after Thorvaldsen had made his bust, presented the artist with a diamond ring. Although a Protestant, accounted now the greatest living sculptor, he was made president of the Academy of St. Luke, a position held by Canova when he was alive, and was commissioned to build the monument of Pius VII in St. Peter's. Mendelssohn, the great composer, had become his warm friend, and used to play for him as he worked in his studio. Sir Walter Scott came to visit the artist, and as the latter could speak scarcely a word of English, the two shook hands heartily, and clapped each other on the shoulder as they parted. When Thorvaldsen was sixty-eight years old, he left Rome to end his days among his own people. The enthusiasm on his arrival was unbounded. The whole city waited nearly three days for his coming. Boats decked with flowers went out to meet him, and so many crowded on board his vessel that it was feared she would sink. The members of the academy came in a body, and the crowd took the horses from the carriage, and drew it themselves through the streets to the palace of Charlottenburg. In the evening there was a grand torchlight procession, followed by a constant round of parties. So beset was he with invitations to dinner, that, to save a little time for himself, he told his servant Wilkins that he would dine with him and his wife. Wilkins, greatly confused, replied, "'What would the world think if it found out that the Chancellor dined with his servant?' "'The world, the world! Have I not told you a thousand times that I don't care in the least what the world thinks about these things?' Sometimes he refused even to dine with the king. Finding at last that society would give him no rest, he went to live with some friends at Nysö, seven hours by boat from Copenhagen. Once more he visited Rome, for a year, receiving royal attentions all through Germany. Two years after, 
as he was sitting in the theatre, he rose to let a lady pass. She saw him bending toward the floor and asked, "'Have you dropped something?' The great man made no answer. He was dead. The funeral was a grand expression of love and honour. His body lay in state in the royal palace, laurel about his brow, the coffin ornamented with floral crowns, one made by the Queen of Denmark, his chisel laid in the midst of laurel and palm, and his great works of art placed about him. Houses were draped in black, bells tolled in all the churches, women threw flowers from their windows before the forty artists who carried the coffin, and the king and prince royal received it in person at the Frue Kirke. Then it was borne to the large museum which Copenhagen had built to receive his work, and buried in the centre of the inner court, which had been prepared under his own hand. A low granite coping surrounds the grave, which is entirely covered with ivy, and on the side is his boyish name, Bertel Bartholomew Thorvaldsen, 1626-1628.